Mark Twain famously said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. The purple-haired, nose-ringed, tatted, social justice warriors of today seem nothing like our top-hatted, petty-coated, Puritan forebearers. But a la Mark Twain, they actually bear an eerie resemblance to one another. Today, we will discuss how contemporary progressivism echoes the Puritanism of the past. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Timeless. It's great, as always, to be with you. Just as a reminder about our posting schedule, you can check out Dennis and Julie, my show with Dennis Prager, every Monday on this YouTube page. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, I do Timeless. And then scattered throughout the week, you will also see what's called Julie Noted videos. This is where I talk about the most pertinent timely news events such as India recently landing on the moon, China establishing Confucius institutes or schools here in the United States, and debate recap of the recent uh, GOP presidential debate. So please hit the subscribe button down below if you would like to stay notified every time I post this new content. And also be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. Those of you who've been watching the show for a while or, or maybe just tuning in and seeing uh, this book right behind my shoulder can tell that one of my favorite reads ever is Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1850 novel, The Scarlet Letter. In the opening scene of that novel, we have Hester Prynne, who is the protagonist of the book, and she has had an extramarital affair. Her husband is across the ocean back in England. This book takes place in Puritan, Massachusetts in the early decades of the first colony being founded in America. Her husband is across the pond in England. He's this old intellectual cerebral guy who Hester really isn't in love with. And while he's gone, she decides to have this extramarital affair with none other than the reverend of the town, Reverend Arthur Dimsdale. And in the opening scene of this book, Hester Prynne is being ridiculed and scorned and spat on for this extramarital affair that she has committed and that has begot her this daughter, this child Pearl. That's how a lot of people know that she has committed adultery because a child just doesn't pop out of nowhere when your husband has been away for some years. So we see Hester Prynne Walking through the town, she has to have this A on her breast to signal that she has committed adultery. And she's walking past all of these Puritan townspeople who are yelling at her, who, as I said, are spitting on her, who are saying things like she ought to be condemned to death. And then Hester Prynne has to go up on this big platform in front of the entire population. And, and she has to go in what's called a pillory. A pillory was one of those old devices that was used for humiliation. And you would put your two hands um, your, your arms actually all the way in the device and your head would be showing and you would have to stand there for hours on end as people heckled you. And so when you read those pages, some may think, wow, that seems like a time way, you know, come and gone where people used to do something like that. But not so much. The idea that someone ought to be condemned and ridiculed and shamed for one mistake that they made in their lives, one moment where they maybe didn't behave as well as they would like to, that's something that we see all the time today. Cancel culture has existed all throughout history, but now it has taken a new form in a different way than the Puritans, but in also a very eerily similar way. So today we are going to be talking about that, how the modern day woke left are the ideological, and in the case of white uh, wokesters, the genetic descendants of our early religious fanatics, the Puritans that came to uh, America in the early 17th century. What's also interesting about this resemblance between progressives and Puritans is that modern day progressives love to paint themselves as anti-religious. They are incredibly hostile to Judeo-Christian values. They say that organized religion is a relic of the past and it's antiquated and it's oppressive. Well, these individuals in many ways exercise all of the 
uh, traditions and the norms that come with religion, but they're just worshiping a different religion that is leftism and wokeism. I'm going to structure this episode by telling you a bit about Puritanism, how it arose in England and then came over here to the United States. And then I'm going to get into the four tenets of Puritanism, what defined those early individuals' faith. And then I'm going to apply those four tenets to modern woke progressives and show you how eerily similar they are. But first, a final note on the Scarlet Letter, because this is really important to shape our discussion and I will be uh, quoting things from the Scarlet Letter throughout this episode. Nathaniel Hawthorne, when he wrote this novel in 1850, he was trying to create a work that was an indictment of the Puritans. He is a big critic of the Puritans, and there is actually a family reason for this. Nathaniel Hawthorne himself was a genetic descendant of the early uh, Puritans. His great-great-grandfather, maybe there are only two greats instead of three, but one of his, his great-great-grandfathers was named John Hathorne, and he was one of the main judges during the Salem witch trials, which occurred in 1692 when all of the people who were accused of practicing witchcraft were uh, executed and hanged. So Nathaniel Hawthorne's relative was one of these judges, and not only was he one of these judges, he was like the judge, the most punitive, um, tyrannical guy who really went on this witch hunt of witches to be executed. So that followed Nathaniel Hawthorne all throughout his life. He was incredibly ashamed of the legacy of his forebearers, so much so that when he graduated from college, he actually changed his last name. Usually it would, or before he changed it, it was spelled Hawthorne. H-A-T-H-O-R-N-E. Nathaniel Hawthorne added a W because he was so, um, just as I said, ashamed of his past that he didn't want anybody to know about um, his, his ties to these people. The Scarlet Letter, the reason why I like the book is because I believe that it is a spiritual novel that teaches you how to overcome injustice. Hester Prynne, as I said, was so relentlessly ridiculed and she had to wear this A on her breast, but she did not whine. She didn't complain. She dealt with this injustice in a way that is incredibly noble, so much so that by the end of the book, the townspeople forgot that the A stood for adultery. They thought it stood for Abel because over time she became such a competent mother seamstress community member she was very pious and charitable that people started to see her in this different way that's what i love about the book but if you want to get a sense of what early puritan america was like that is the one of the biggest reasons for nathaniel hawthorne creating that novel so let's go now into the first section of this episode which is the history of early american puritanism how did it arise well there's actually a funny story about this the really kind of start of the story for Puritanism was back in the 1530s when King Henry VIII, who was the King of England, wanted to break from the Catholic Church. Why? Because he wanted to get a divorce from his wife. And the Catholic Church, under the papacy uh, headquartered in, in Rome, would not allow any divorce. So because of this sole reason, King Henry VIII actually created what's called the Church of England, also referred to as the Anglican Church, so that he could be allowed to get a divorce. Now, King Henry VIII claimed that he wanted to break from Catholicism in order to pursue a different flavor of Christianity that was more in accordance with what God would want. But actually, it was because of this personal reason. So a lot of people in England got very upset with King Henry VIII, not because they loved Catholicism, but because the Church of England wasn't actually this different flavor of Christianity that King Henry VIII had promised. It was really just the Catholic Church under a different name that allowed the king to get the divorce from the wife that he wanted to leave. So this led to civil war for decades and decades, I think over a century in England between people who wanted to go back to Catholicism and crucially people who wanted to get away from the Catholic resemblance of the Anglican Church and go towards a more Protestant, in their eyes, godly religion. So this is the context under which the Puritans emerged. 
Also, this used to drive me crazy when I was in school and I was learning about the Pilgrims and the Puritans. There are all of these synonymous names that are given to uh, these people, but we're, we're constantly uh, using uh, different ones. So p Pilgrims themselves, Pilgrims with a small p, are religious people who go on a journey. For instance, if you look at um, Muslims, one of the tenets of the faith, which you would know from watching my Islam 101 episode, is that Muslims have to go on the Hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia and the holy sites of Mecca and Medina. So those are small p Puritans. It's just a general term that refers to religious voyagers. Pilgrims with a capital P is what we in the United States refer to when we talk about the people who got on the Mayflower and came to establish the colony in Massachusetts. Those are also Puritans with a capital P. The Pilgrims with a capital P are the same thing as the Puritans with a capital P. Puritans was just a name that they called themselves because they believed that they re represented the purest form of the religion. So that's just a little contextual note. Took me 23 years to understand uh, those differences, so I wanted to convey that to you. So this whole idea that the Church of England was too Catholic and wasn't sufficiently Protestant was the context under which the Pilgrims slash Puritans, whatever you want to call them, emerged. They wanted to break away from the Church of England and go towards this more Protestant direction. So they got on the boat, the Mayflower, and came all the way to the American, then British, colonies. So what's really important to understand about the Puritans is that unlike other early settlers in the new, new World, they came almost solely for religious purposes. Prior to the Puritans, there were a lot of people uh, from, from France, from Spain, also from England, who came out to establish colonies because they wanted to make money. They wanted to have access to the spice trade that was in the New World. They wanted to uh, encounter different livestock and send back different kinds of meats and different kinds of eggs, et cetera. They were going, oh, and, and not to mention they wanted to buy land and make a, a living out in the New World. So a lot of people came for economic purposes. The Puritans were totally different. They came for religious purposes. They wanted to create a utopian, godly place on earth. They went to the new world to establish a new world of religious order, breaking away from the too Catholic, in their eyes, Church of England. So they were incredibly ideological, they were enthusiastic, and they were also unbending because they were very, very um, steadfast in this religious belief of creating God's kingdom on earth. So the reason why I refer to them as religious fanatics is because they took a very noble idea of wanting to bring godly principles and, and uh, exercise those in a, in a high way. They took those and then took it way too far. And that there's nothing wrong with believing in God. There's nothing wrong with practicing a religion. But they were so dictatorial and so, as I said, unbending in the way that they enforce this, that it does count as religious fanaticism. There's a difference between believing in God and practicing a religion. But also, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, I appreciate, does a good job of acknowledging this in The Scarlet Letter. In a way, you kind of needed religious fanatics in those early stages of the American colonies because there were so many challenges that these early settlers endured that literally in order to get through them, you needed a kind of fanatical adherence to God and belief that you were creating his kingdom on earth. There were 102 people, pilgrims, Puritans, who came on the Mayflower to Massachusetts. In the first winter, nearly half of those 102 settlers died. So people, I mean, there was such a harsh winter. They didn't have any kind of the, the heat, heat and ventilation that we have now. They were li living in literally huts that they had to build for themselves and half of their people died. Also, as we know, 
all too well from American history. Um, they, they went to war a lot with Indian tribes. They massacred the Indians. The in Indians massacred them. So they faced a lot of threats from there. And also, even without a harsh winter, even without the threats of Indian tribes, it is really hard to get on a boat and go to a land that you do not know and set up a civilization. So again, and Nathaniel Hawthorne says this, it is a good thing that they were unrelenting and that they were a bit times uh, too sturdy in their ideas and in their character because you needed someone with a, a steadfast commitment to something higher, even if they took it too far in order to bear those conditions. And by the way, in 1750, so that's about 120, 130 years after the founding of the first colony, the population of the colony went from 46 people, because remember most of the, or half of the 102 died. It went from 46 people to a million people in a century. That shows a crazy amount of devotion to a cause bigger than your own. So that's the history of the way that Puritanism emerged in the United States. Now let's go on to what I have identified as four key tenets of Puritanism. I have done a lot of reading on this subject. The Epic Times actually has some historians that do really good commentaries on the puritanical um, uh, seeds of progressivism. Also right here on the set, I have this book by Noah Rothman. Who, uh, this book is called the rise of the new Puritans. So I have gotten a lot of my information from him. But here is the Julie Hartman distillation of the Puritan ideology into four tenets. First, this idea that there is an elect. The Puritans, in addition to being pilgrims, both small p and big p pilgrims, were Calvinists. These are all kind of, as I said earlier, synonymous terms. Calvinism was a form of Protestantism, a different flavor of Christianity, which held that some people were born as chosen by God as the elect. These individuals were righteous and virtuous, and they showed everyone that they were the elect by exercising outsized righteousness and virtuousness. And so there was the elect and there was not the elect. And everyone else who wasn't the elect were inherently sinful. And the elect's job was to essentially civilize them and mitigate the havoc that the non-elect would wreak on society. So basically, there's this idea that there's the worthy and the unworthy. The worthy have a right to tell the unworthy how to live their lives. That's tenant number one. Tenant number two is that people's private actions matter just as much as their public actions. Puritanism held that you, if you were the elect, you had a right to police the way that people privately lived in the private decisions that they made. That's the whole thing with Hester Prynne. She made a private decision to have an affair, it begot her a child, and the town deemed it their business to punish and ridicule this woman and condemn her to a diminished life. In fact, early in the book, they say, quote, Hester Prynne will be a living sermon against sin. So it's this idea that your private life says a lot about who you are and matters, and people have a right to police your private life because your private decisions are harmful to the rest of the population and affects everyone around you, not just what you decide to do with your life. And a big way that people would punish the private actions was to shame them. Shame and shaming people is a huge, or was a huge component of early Puritan societies. And of course, along that, when you shame people, you are not allowed to dissent and defend yourself. Uh, they would look uh, down upon people who would defend those who were being shamed. Again, I'm gonna get more into it, but you will see the uh, ways that mo modern day cancel culture eerily resemble the tactics of the Puritans. And the great irony is that one of the tenets of the Bible is that you, thou shall not judge, you shall not judge people. And another great irony is that woke people nowadays, they constantly say, well, who am I to judge? Non-judging is one of the tenets of wokeism. But you see, with both the early Puritans and the woke people, they claim to not judge, but they judge all the time. 
judge and judgment is their middle name. Okay, so number one is this idea of the elect. Number two is this idea that your private behavior matters as much as your public behavior and the elect has the right to punish and shame you if your private actions do not accord with their moral understanding of the world. Number three, and this is uh, one I have to laugh at because there's a funny quote associated with it, is that Puritans waged a war on fun. There's an H.L. Mencken line. H.L. Mencken was a uh, American essayist and uh, comedy writer. He said, Puritanism was the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> That's exactly right. In early Puritan America, there were all of these laws against gaming in your house. I'm reading here from the Massachusetts Bay Colony Statute, quote, it is ordered that all persons whatsoever that have cards, dice, or tables in their houses shall make way with them before the next court under pain of punishment. So you're not allowed to play games. You weren't allowed in the early Massachusetts Bay Colony to wear fancy clothes. God knows you weren't allowed to smoke or consume alcohol. And ready for this? In the early decades, Puritans were not allowed to celebrate Christmas. They were allowed and encouraged to honor the holiday of Christmas, that is Christ's birth. You were punished if you didn't honor the holiday of Christmas, but people were actually forbidden from celebrating because you're supposed to have an austere, uh, sense of, of honoring the holiday. Celebrating means you're engaging in the sinful indulgence of pleasure. Noah Rothman, who is the aforementioned author of the book, The New Puritans, writes, quote, Puritans waged a war on decadence, frivolity, and pleasure for its own sake. They believed that it was a mark of their seriousness, but it was actually a mark of their fanaticism. That is absolutely right. And then number four, the fourth Julie Hartman <laughs> identified tenant of Puritanism was this utopian aspect. As mentioned, the Puritans wanted to get away from the Church of England, create a utopian universe in the new world, a new world in the new world of what God's utopian world would look like. They viewed themselves as the new Israelites journeying across the ocean, just as Moses journeyed across the Red Sea to establish a promised land instead of Israel, America, in which they would ha inhabit. This was um, the early governor of Massachusetts, John Winthrop's idea of a city on a hill being a light to the rest of the world. They held that there could be perfect harmony in social matters achieved if you sufficiently regulated both private and public life. And then we see here, this is another point of um, Noah Rothman, that as the modern day left has gotten more progressive and less liberal, they run towards this idea that a utopia on earth can be achieved, which is a perfect segue into the next part of the show where I'm going to be applying these four tenets of Puritanism to the wokesters of the modern day to show that they are in fact puritanical. But first I want to talk to you about my pillow. I use a lot of my pillow products. I walk into work wearing my slippers because they are incredibly comfortable and durable. I go home and I sleep on my pillow on the Giza Dream bed sheets, on a my pillow mattress topper, and I also use my towels, which are great and very absorbent. And you can use all of these products too and get them at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman, which is my last name, spelled H-A-R-T-M-A-N. For a limited time, you will get 60% off of the Giza Dream bed sheets that comes with a 60 day money back guarantee and a 10 year warranty. You, you will receive a set for as low as $39.99 when you use the promo code Hartman. And for a limited time, along with any order, you will receive Mike Lindell's soft cover book free when you use that promo code. Along with this off offer, you will get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the aforementioned MyPillow mattress topper, MyPillow towel sets, and more. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Hartman or call one 800 5 566-6745 and use the promo code Hartman. 
So now on to the modern day Puritans, the wokesters, who again are the ideological and in many cases the genetic descendants of the early religious fanatics who they decried. The great irony is that woke people today are so allergic outwardly to religion. But as G.K. Chesterton, the great Christian English author said in the 20th century, he said, when people reject religion, it's not that they believe in nothing, it's that they believe in anything. Something comes into that space that was occupied by religion. And often it is a, not a rejection of religion, it is just a different kind of religion that comes into the fore. So let's go again through those four tenets and I, I will show you how they are just as much the tenets for the woke as they are tenets for the Puritans. Let's start with the idea of the elect that some people are born righteous and virtuous and other people aren't. And it is the responsibility of the righteous and virtu uh, virtuous to civil civilize and impose their order on those who are not. I mean, we see this all the time, all the time. People in modern America view themselves as the elect, even though they won't use that exact diction, they really intrinsically do. Let's look at people who protest on college campuses against the established curriculum, or people who protest against speakers on college campuses because they believe that they have nothing to learn from those speakers, or people who decry the United States Constitution, refuse to, to read it, refuse to have anything good to say about it, and want to replace that system with a new order. Those are hallmarks of what an elect does. An elect views itself as so superior, superior, excuse me, both morally and intellectually, that they don't need to look at other people who have different ideas of how to do things. They don't need to have any respect for the established norms and rules and traditions that literally centuries of people built and refined over time for our benefit. All of that just goes out the window. We are the elect. We know better. We can tear it all down in one fell swoop because we were born, born the enlightened and the righteous. I mean, that is leftism at its core. Now, there's a difference between liberalism and leftism. L liberalism holds the, the basic tenets and um, traditions of the U.S. Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, you know, we need police in the streets <laughs> instead of a defund the police movement. Liberals are in many ways very reasonable. Leftists aren't. Leftism wants to fundamentally destroy the old instead of conserving the things that have been established. And that whole ideology of just destroying and rebuilding, that in, an, in it of itself is a kind of elect worldview. When people say, it is not my job to educate you, we see that you know, with the, the whole talks about race. All the time in college, I would hear people who would you know, talk about how systemically racist the United States is. And when you would say, could you please provide some examples of this rampant systemic racism? It's not my job to educate you. I'm the elect. I get to have any opinions I want and I don't have to explain them and make it clear to you, you little imbecile, bigot, plebeian. <laughs> Every time we hear something like that, it just screams elect. How about our own president, Joe Biden, who talks about the importance of democracy and the importance of the rule of law. And then meanwhile, he has taken bribes over many years from uh, Chinese nationals, Ukrainian, Kazakh, Romanian nationals. Is that very much in accordance with democracy and the rule of law? No, but he can do it because he's the elect. When he waxes eloquent about how there's so much privilege in the United States, specifically in college admissions, and we have to uproot legacy preference because it is a sign of that privilege. And then he goes on the side and he's texting, according to newly released uh, text messages, he's texting the president of UPenn, Amy Gutman, to get his granddaughter, who doesn't have good test scores or grades, into Penn because he has a connection to this woman. That is another example of the idea that he views himself as the elect. Rules for thee, but not for me and my grandchild. People like John Kerry and Leonardo DiCaprio, when they whine about climate change and wag their finger about all the things that you should do and then fly around on private planes, they view themselves as the elect. 
people who say that we have to defund the police, but then meanwhile they live behind gates or live behind dormant buildings. People like Karen Bass, the mayor of Los Angeles, Lori Lightfoot, the former mayor of Chicago, Eric Adams, the current mayor of New York City, and all of the liberals in Martha's Vineyard who say sanctuary cities are so necessary. We welcome immigrants with open arms. And then when immigrants come into their city, they go, no, 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 not here. They view themselves as having different sets of standards for themselves, but not to be applied to the rest of us. This is beyond hypocrisy. A lot of people would look at this and go, ah, these politicians are just being hypocritical. It isn't, and I'll tell you why. There's no shame that they have about breaking the rules. They don't ever acknowledge that they're hypocritical. The people on Martha's Vineyard when Florida Governor Ron DeSantis sent those immigrants, those people on Martha's Vineyard got on television and radio channels and they would say very openly, we do not want these people here. Even though weeks earlier, they were putting up signs saying all immigrants are welcome. These individuals don't have any shame about their hypocrisy, precisely because they think it is their divine right to exercise hypocrisy. They think that it is their divine right to do whatever they have the power to do because they are inherently more virtuous than the rest of us. There's also this kind of certainty about people that comes with dividing the world between the righteous and the not righteous. You know, in, in the eyes of many modern day woke progressives, if you vote Republican, you are inherently defective. And if you vote Democrat or outwardly claim to be a social justice warrior, then you are inherently righteous. And there's very little that a non-righteous person can do to change their view in the eyes of others. And there's very little that a righteous person can do to also change that view. We see this in The Scarlet Letter, one of the many reasons why I love this book. It is such a good explore, exploration of human nature. Hester Prynne, yes, did commit the uh, adultery. But she also had a co-adulterer who had the affair with her. As I said at the beginning of the show, it was the reverend of the town, Arthur Dimsdale. And the whole book is about how Hester Prynne is seen as so evil and defective because of her mistake. And then Reverend Dimsdale is seen as this godly, just celestial, angelic being. It's important to note that in The Scarlet Letter, Arthur Dimsdale does not reveal his identity as the co-adulterer. Hester Prynne, because she's in love with him and doesn't want him to suffer, also doesn't reveal that he is the father of the child. But it's just fascinating how the town is so willing to hate this woman while the man did the same thing, but he is seen in such a great way. So there's this scene at the end of the book where Arthur Dimsdale, because he is so racked with guilt about his sin and hiding from the town that he committed this sin, that he gets on the very platform that at the beginning of the book Hester Prynne stood on and he reveals himself as the father of the child, the co-adulterer in the relationship. And in this dramatic moment, he opens his um, shirt, he tears it off, and he shows the townspeople that he has an A on his breast, that he actually put on himself, he branded himself because he was so guilty, uh, feeling so guilty, but he just revealed to the whole town, I am not this perfect reverend who you think I am, I'm the father of the child. And interestingly, after Reverend Dimsdale revealed himself, there were a lot of people in the town who refused to believe that he was telling the truth. I'm reading here from Nathaniel Hawthorne. There were certain persons who denied that there was any mark whatsoever on his breast that day. According to these highly respectable witnesses, the minister, conscious that he was dying, decided to make his death a parable in order to impress on his admirers that the mighty and mournful, uh, the, the mighty and mournful lesson that in the view of infinite purity, we are all sinners alike. So people in the town refused to believe, even though he admitted to his sin, that, that he actually committed the sin, and chose to see him as lying about it in his final moments in order to prove or make a statement to the whole town that all of us are in some way defective. That is such a great part of the book because it shows this way that we tend to reduce people as either totally good or totally bad. 
And as I said, if you are deemed a conservative ev evil bigot, no matter how much good you do, you will always be seen as this defective person. We see that with Dennis Prager, my dear friend and co-host. People call him a homophobe because he uh, came out against gay marriage, the legalization of gay marriage in 2015. But he treats gay people beautifully. He's best friends with many gay couples like Dave Rubin. A gay man serves on the board of his organization PragerU. He is the godfather to a gay couple's child. But no matter how much good he does, he is always going to be seen in the eyes of progressives as this homophobe. Similarly, you look at someone like Joe Biden. They have decided that he is this great leader and the, the embodiment of all the values that they like. And no matter how much comes out about bribes that he takes, he will never be seen as anything less than this righteous person. That is a, an elect versus non-elect worldview 101, reducing people to either totally good or totally bad. Now on to tenet number two, the idea that your private actions deserved to be policed because they are not just actions that you are deciding to take and only affect you, but they affect society writ large and they are harmful to the greater ideology that you are trying to pursue. The light bulbs we use in our homes are now under attack. The cars that people drive, you know, indicate whether they are pro saving the environment or they are, they are these awful people who don't care about their pollution. Whether or not you decide to wear a mask indicates whether you are the elect or the non-elect. The newspapers you read or you don't read. If you read the Epic Times, you're this conservative bigot, but if you read the New York Times, you are a good person to society because you are reading the enlightened newspaper. I mean, there are all of these, these ways that, that our private life is policed. How about the costumes that you are not allowed to wear on Halloween? They literally tell you that you are an awful person. And in some schools, they even ban costumes like if you dress up as a Native American or if you do the, the face paint that is associated with Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. If you culturally appropriate, you are bad. And so now we have to prevent you from doing that. If you like a certain artist or type of music, you're deemed as defective. It's not just that it's your private decision, it's everyone's business because you are legitimizing bigotry if you listen to Kanye West. If you eat hamburgers, you are anti, you know, saving the animals and thus a horrible person. We see that really the policing of the private life in the Puritan uh, decades is really no different from the progressive decades now. Which brings us to number three, the war on fun. That quote, that Puritanism is the fear that someone somewhere may be having a good time. Well, we see that today where comedy has been ruined, fun has been ruined, interesting TV shows that you just kick back and relax and want to watch to get a break from life are deemed as awful. Everything has to be beholden to the greater ideology. In the Puritan time, you, everything had to be suffused with a religious, godly perspective. And in the woke, modern, progressive time, everything has to be suffused with a, a uh, woke, racially gender conscious ideology. Let's look at what has happened to comedy with the infiltration of wokeism. Here are some stand-up segments from a comedian named Hannah Gadsby. You decide whether or not they are funny. I wouldn't want to be a straight white man. Not if you paid me. Although the pay would be substantially better. <laughs> It's not my place to be angry on a comedy stage. I'm supposed to be doing self-deprecating humour. Um, people feel safer when men do the angry comedy. Uh, they're the kings of the genre. When I do it, I'm just a miserable lesbian ruining all the fun and the banter. When men do it, heroes of free speech. You can hear the diminished laughter after she says each of her jokes because they're really not funny. Comedy is about pushing the boundaries. You're gonna offend people if it's good comedy and you can laugh at it. But now you can't make fun of Irish people for eating potatoes. You can't poke fun at you know certain groups because it's so angry and bigoted. So then what happens to comedy is it just becomes 
jokes about privilege, and that's not funny. So we see here the war on fun. You can't just laugh and enjoy yourself. It has to be within the appropriate boundaries of what is deemed acceptable. How about the war on children's fun that was happening during the pandemic, or as Dennis Prager always says, during the lockdowns, because the lockdowns were wreaking the havoc much more than the existence of the virus. There were schools all over the country that forbade children who were the smallest, made up the smallest percentage of deaths of COVID-19. Literally like 0.00001% of children died of COVID. It, it, was, it was ridiculous to enforce masks on them. But we saw that all over the country, people were doing it because again, ideology comes before everything else. Let's listen to some news coverage of ruining recess in the name of safety. Everyone we spoke to today generally agrees that age has a lot to do with compliance. And in general, the younger the crowd, the harder the sell. I'm like, uh, I have to wear them on a bike ride, like around the neighborhood. That, that'll be annoying. It's kind of hard to talk in a little bit. Molly and Reese Fredericks aren't thrilled about it, but they're old enough to get the safety value of a mask. So is nine-year-old Charlie Lopez and his six-year-old brother, Johnny. It's a whole different ball game when you ask three-year-old Elizabeth. And we certainly didn't have deep enough pockets to convince five-year-old Ryan. Well, how much money would I have to give you to wear a mask, Ryan? $1,000. The experts say expect some resistance and stay calm. Easing kids into this is okay. Just try to focus on the positive. It's not a punishment. It's not that we want them to be afraid of going outside. It's that we want them to be safe. Richard Malley is an infectious disease specialist. He says the best thing you can do is be honest with kids, but don't scare them. Rather, empower them to help keep all of us safe. Other advice we got today, let your younger children help choose or maybe decorate their mask. Practice putting it on a favorite doll or a stuffed animal. As for teens, remind them that this is serious enough that they've canceled school. And it's not you making the rules, it's the governor. We're live in Natick. I'm Mary Salad at WCDB News Center 5. Joining us to help guide you through your back to school questions and concerns is infectious disease specialist Dr. Susie Hoda and epidemiologist Ray Watt Dionandon. Hi, my name's Elise. I was wondering what to do with your mask at recess. The mask All at right, recess. <laughs> Yeah, great question from Elise. So, you know, if you're going outside for recess and you think you can keep more than two meters of distance between yourself and your friends, you can take off your mask. If you don't think you can keep that distance, you should probably keep your mask on. Um, and I would suggest that you have a little plastic or paper bag that you can slip your mask into and put into your pocket or maybe carry a purse or have a, a fanny pack that you can put it into so that you can easily get it again when you need to go back into the building. I want to know when COVID will end and will I be able to hug friends when I go back to school? Oh, oh good goodness. One. Yeah, that breaks the heart, doesn't it? I, I mean, it's such an important part of the, the social interaction of kids. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I wish I could say when this will end and you can actually um, be the way that things were before. but. You know, I think what we're waiting for is development of, of an effective vaccine and having it out there for people to actually to be available to people and really good uptake of that vaccine before we can really think about lifting some of the restrictions. I suspect that might be a couple of years away even. So, uh, you know, that's sort of what I'm, I'm um, positioning in my head. Uh, so unfortunately, not anytime soon in my, my opinion. I characterized this as the sacrifice of fun in the name of ideology. Now, some people listening will be saying, well, Julie, it's not sacrifice for fun in the name of ideology. It's sacrifice for fun in the name of safety. But no, that's not true. Because as I said, children made up a infinitely small decimal point with many zeros after it of COVID deaths. And so it was not in accordance with science. It was not in accordance with safety. It was in accordance with an ideology that if we decide that you ought to do something, you have to do it. Final example I'll give here of the really puritanical war on fun and pleasure for its own sake is that no longer can you turn on the TV and just watch something for entertainment. It has to be suffused with some woke diktats. Let's listen to a Disney segment about uh, racism. And then after that, there will be a Netflix segment on transgenderism. 
This is for kids. This country was built on slavery, which means slaves built this country. Tilled this land from sea to sea to sea. First it was rice, tobacco, sugar cane. Then Whitney did his thing and cotton became king. And we were its soldiers. Four million strong. Fighting for America's freedoms, even though we remained America's slaves. slaves. Built this country. The descendants of slaves continue to build this. Slaves, slaves built, built this country. country. And we, the descendants of slaves in America, have earned reparations for their suffering. And continue to earn reparations every moment we spend submerged in the system. Systemic prejudice, racism, and white, white supremacy, supremacy that America was founded with and still has not atoned for. Slaves, Slaves built, built this country. country. Not only field hands, but carpenters, masons, blacksmiths, musicians, inventors built cities from Jamestown to New Orleans to Banneker, Washington. Washington. 40 acres and a mule. We'll take the 40 acres, keep the mule. We, we made, made your, your families rich. rich. From the southern plantation heirs to the northern bankers to the New England ship owners, the founding fathers, former presidents, current the Illuminati, the New World Order. Slaves, slaves built, built this country. country. We had Tubman, Turner, Frederick D. Then they say Lincoln freed the slaves. But slaves were men. And women. And only we can free ourselves. Emancipation, Emancipation is not freedom. Well, my heart says that the way I feel most myself is to go by the name Fred. That's because I'm non-binary. And Fred is the name that fits me best. And I also use they and them. Because calling me a she or a he doesn't feel right to me. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> and then the final tenet is this utopianism, where Puritans believed that you could create a perfectly harmonious society that would reflect the will of God, whereas woke progressives think that you can create a perfectly harmonious society reflecting the will of leftism. The defund the police movement. People would say, oh, we can totally defund the police and we can replace them with mental health professionals who will de-escalate violent crime. While we're at it, we can de-incarcerate thousands of people from prison and all of us are going to be so liberated by the injustice that plagues us that we will join hands and skip through a daisy field and all get along. That is a utopian idea of society. This whole idea that we can achieve perfect fairness by allowing transgender women to compete in in women's sports. People think, oh, that's perfectly fair. But of course it isn't because you just end up oppressing biological women who do not have the same prowess and abilities and strength as biological men. That's the whole thing about trying to go towards a utopia in the name of equality. You actually end up making things dystopian and unequal. DEI diktats are seen as very utopian and barreling us towards equality. But really, the war on merit has led to an utter disaster. The MCAT has removed 25% of its questions. The MCAT is the exam that, that uh, medical students um, or prospective medical students take to gain admission. They've replaced 25% of questions on the MCAT that were about medicine and have made them about social justice because that is fairer to people taking the tests. And it means there won't be as big of a racial disparity in those who score well on the MCAT. But that's going to lead to chaos and moral havoc because we're going to be seeing a lot more surgeons who don't know how to do surgery and will end up killing people because they didn't learn the tenets of science and um, and medicine. And then finally, you know, just to give another example, and there are so many, electric cars. It is a noble thing to want to cr have a greener footprint. No one has an issue with that. But barreling towards these, these um, laws where in California you can't sell any gas-powered vehicles or trucks by 2035, it's going to lead to an utter disaster. Also, in order to get the batteries for electric cars, you have to mine for precious metals, which make up the batteries of those cars. So pursuing utopia just leads you to be irrational and undermines the very goal that you want to pursue. It is noble to want equality, but it is not noble to pursue equality to such a fanatical extent that you end up bringing about evil. As the great Tom Sowell says, there are no solutions in life, there are only trade-offs. You are never going to get perfection. You just have to hopefully create a society that yields the best possible outcome. So in conclusion, despite all of the similarities be between Puritans and progressives, there, is, there are two big differences that I would like to identify. 
The first is that Puritans, for all of their fanaticism, did have a vision of what they wanted to achieve. It was way too far, this idea of a perfectly harmonious society in the image of God's will. But they wanted people to get married. They wanted people to have children. They wanted people to be members of the church and to abide by the rule of law. That is a vision of the way that you would like to see society ordered. The problem with modern day progressivism is that there really is no long-term vision because the ideas of what is deemed acceptable are constantly changing. 10 years ago, the very Democrats who are saying that it is bigoted to have any questions about whether or not gay marriage should be legalized, they themselves were opposing gay marriage. The same Democrats who are saying that it is bigoted to call illegal immigrants illegal immigrants were using those terms 10 years ago. So when the standards of what is deemed acceptable keep changing, that means that there really isn't a long-term goal of what ought to be achieved. The left says that we want to abolish all bad things. That is the ultimate, if there is any end goal that they say that they want, that is the ultimate end goal. But again, what constitutes bad things changes constantly. And so there really isn't any uh, future goal. So that's the first thing. The Puritans had a vision, progressives don't. And relatedly, which brings us to the second thing, is that at least Puritans, for all of their misguided ways of going about it, were advocating for things that were overwhelmingly beneficial to society, and at the very least, less detrimental than what progressives are ad advocating for. Again, marriage, raising a family, being a community member, a member of your church, abiding by the rule of law, strengthening your civilization and trying to move the ball forward. Those are overwhelmingly beneficial things. The problem with the new Puritanism is that they are trying to push us in a direction that is overwhelmingly detrimental to society. Polygamy, rampant crime, rampant de-incarceration, rampant uh, changing of our norms to pursue a, a utopian green energy world, which is just going to lead to disaster. So the ways that both went about it were terrible, but at least the goals and the things that they were pushing us towards in the Puritan society were better than this new Puritanism that we are seeing now. I'll end with a quote that is unattributed. <laughs> Why does that happen? It's so difficult. I want to give the person credit, but it, it, it is cited in the Noah Rothman book as well as other uh, uh, sources that I've read on Puritanism. And it says that progressivism is, quote, the preservation of certain biblical habits and ideas even after the atrophy of biblical faith. That is exactly right. Religion is alive and well. It is a new kind of religion. It is a fanaticism and fanaticism of any kind is dangerous. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Reminder to hit the subscribe button down below so that you can stay notified with every new post of content. I will see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>